underway, and I thought I would um, spend a few minutes this morning giving you an overview of where things stand in the college and hopefully where we're going. Um, same kind of soup to nuts overview we've done in the past, everything from admission to endowment. Uh, and so um, without any further ado, let me begin by welcoming new members to the community. I understand we have a number of exchange students for whom this is the first semester on campus. If any of you are here, you might If this is the first time, then we do this at the beginning of each semester. It's our town meeting uh, where you get a chance to see what's going on and to ask questions. Um, since we met in September, at the beginning of the last semester, quite a few things have gone on, and I thought I would just give you a quick tour. First of all, the core of the, pro of the college, of course, is the academic program, and uh, we have a number of faculty searches underway. Uh, they're being done in a slightly different way this year, involving a sort of multidisciplinary approach and uh, a single large committee that's recruiting in the college. And there are 450 applications so far that are very strong. A number of interviews are underway. So when you see uh, notices come out that a candidate is on campus, you might pay particular attention and go attend their seminar and offer your feedback, because we're picking new members of our family. Um, in addition to this, uh, there are a lot of very new um, ideas and courses that are coming out. You know that Olin has an innovation fund and an, an interest in sparking new ideas. So there are five new courses that have never appeared at Olin before underway uh, since last September. And there are, of course, more continuing. I think the percentage of new courses developed as a, as a percentage of the total number of courses offered at Olin is one of the highest in the country. And that's, and that's also a measure of the time and energy that faculty put into creating new courses, which is a lot more difficult than continuing to teach the same set of notes that you did 30 years ago. Okay, We don't do that. We've only been here for 10. Um, we've been successful at bringing in some new support for the school as well. We have a new grant from the Claire Booth Luce Foundation, provide $180,000 to help uh, sponsor the research, essentially, of 24 female students over the next three years. Um, in addition, the Davis Educational Foundation has provided us another grant, $150,000, to continue the faculty development work that was underway at Olin. This is all good news. And in addition, uh, a new gift from George Hatsopoulos, um, the founder of Thermo Electron and 23 other companies and a member of the board at MIT, $150,000 to kickstart our efforts in entrepreneurship. Uh, particularly getting engineers better engaged with uh, entrepreneurs in the community. Uh, we hope this is the beginning of a trend of other investors in that area because it's really quite a need for the college. In addition, uh, you may remember vaguely, if you were here last year, that we went through this accreditation process with NEASC, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, rather elaborate uh, process taking about a year um, I got a phone call from Barbara Brittingham, the, essentially the president of NEASC, uh, in December, congratulating me that we had done very well. Um, I'm still waiting for the letter, okay? Um, apparently, no one who was uh, voted on during that session has gotten their letter yet, so I don't think there's anything special about Olin uh, not getting a letter, but uh, soon we'll have very official good news, and I think the good news is that it's a 10-year accreditation this time, meaning that we won't have to do this again, probably in my term here at the school, anyway. Um, we've done it three times since 2004, and that's more than any other school that we know of in New England. So we have more experience now than most of the people on the panel. Um, now that we've done the ask, we get the privilege of doing ABET, okay, which is underway. Uh, all the preparations are started. ABET is the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. This is not institutional now. This is talking about individual programs. So the mechanical engineering program gets accredited separately from the electrical and computer engineering program and so forth. These folks will send a team of visitors to the campus next fall. This year, we get the 
uh, the uh, privilege of developing the self-study, which is quite thorough and detailed. So faculty members and students are being asked to document almost everything that we do, put them into binders, and then write a, a very detailed report that goes to ABET later in the year. So you'll hear a lot more about this. The process is being led this year by Jessica Townsend, who probably um, isn't comfortable with me mentioning her name uh, because she is that sort of person who's very quiet and humble behind the scenes, but she's doing an awful lot of volunteer work and I think deserves a great deal of credit for this, along with everyone else who's involved in planning. Part of the preparation is a lot of communication with faculty, staff, and students, and so you will hear more about this during the year. Um, admission. It's that season. Maybe you've noticed. Candidates' weekends aren't far away. Um, why are we doing Candidates' Weekends? Well, we have 781 applications this year. It's up slightly from last year. You know, we had all hoped it would go up a lot from last year. It went up slightly. Still a bit of a puzzle why it's not going up faster. 247 candidates, 44% women, 57% men. They will be here at the end of this month. Um, here's the numbers. We'll look for a class size of 84. There are two that are returning from a gap year. So that really means we'll only enroll 82 out of this set of uh, candidates uh, this time. So stay tuned. You'll hear more about Candidates Weekend. Um, recruitment of the class of 2017 is already underway. So the admission thing never ends, OK? It's a constant process. By the way, remember those guys who graduated last May? Um, we got a six six-month report from them, how's it going? And basically what we found out is 96% of them are either employed or in graduate school, which is very good. Uh, actually, a high percentage of them were in that category when they walked across the stage, so it's not that much change. Uh, we found out that 4% uh, of them are looking or else they just disappear. They're, you know, hi <laughs> hiking the Appalachian Trail or they have more important things to do, um, but a very small percentage. Average starting salary, almost 70000 Did anybody know that we're in a recession? <laughs> um, Olin students are in great demand, even in bad times, which is quite good news, I think, for us as a community. Um, what's happening this year? We have a number of students are going to walk across the stage in May. And while this is very preliminary, because the, se the seasons is, you know, this is January data. Um, 28 have already accepted jobs, and others are thinking about jobs. The big vacuum cleaner in Washington keeps sucking students up there, uh, as usual. Uh, Boeing now is on the list. And we have some new employers, some first-timers to our campus, and if they follow the same trend that we've seen in the past, they'll be back, and there'll be even more. And as the years go by, there'll be uh, other vacuum cleaners show up as well. At least that's the plan. Um, some are also heading to graduate school. Most graduate school admissions are still very early, and most people haven't heard yet. A few have, and one of the interesting things is Harvard Business School has this 2 plus 2 program, which I'm sure you've heard about. In the class of 2012, we already have six students who have said yes to the 2 plus 2. Uh, so there, this is, I think, the largest number in one batch that Olin has sent off to HBS. So we have sort of a pipeline going there as well that's growing. Uh, many, of course, are waiting on graduate school and Fulbrights. So the fact that their numbers aren't up doesn't mean um, anything other than we're waiting for the letters to come back. Now, a little less enthusiastic news, uh, the endowment. Maybe some of you have noticed uh, in the fall, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of negative news about debts in Europe and um, the Congress not reaching a conclusion on what it should do about certain things. Um, the financial markets didn't like this very much. In fact, in addition to that, I think it was Standard & Poor's, wasn't it, or Moody's, that downrated um, the U.S.'s credit debt, which has never happened in the history of the country. Um, and, and so, as a result, the values of most investments um, throughout the economy are lower today than they were in June. And that's true for Olin as well, including our endowment. 
So the fiscal year 12, which starts on July 1 of 2011 and ends on June 30 of 2012, so we're essentially dead center in the middle of it, the endowment um, investment performance, you know, the percentage increase in the endowment since July 1 is negative. It's minus 6.5%. And the value at the end of December, one month ago, was 339, 336 million. Now, Steve's very um, concerned about these numbers, as you might guess. He sort of lives in the um, stock market world. And he told me just before the meeting started today that January was a better month. So the endowment is in the 340s somewhere. Um, it's not you know, over 500 million yet, but at least it's headed in the right direction at the moment, which is good news. This is still in the range of about a million dollars per student that we have, and that's sort of the threshold uh, for our financial model. Uh, this latest decline, though, um, the drop from, of 6% from last summer has some longer-term consequences for us. Uh, we had known for since 2008 that the drop in the value of the endowment that fall would have longer-term consequences because of the 12-quarter trailing average for our investment model. And we predicted that FY12 and FY13, this fiscal year and next fiscal year, would sort of be the eye of the needle that we needed to get through financially before we began to feel wind under our wings in the investment market and could start to make new investments. Well, the decline that we've seen this fall is going to make that eye of the needle a little bit bigger. Okay, it's not going to end next fiscal year. I think it's going to go on for a couple more years until it recovers. So that's the, that's the latest. Um, the trustee investment committee, by the way, those are the guys who are fiscally responsible for making decisions on how to invest this money and how to make sure that the return is as high as we can get, are not happy. Um, we're at a stage where we're now reevaluating the process that we're using and the, the managers that we're using uh, for the investments, and I imagine there'll be some change in the next six months to a year in terms of who is managing it outside the college. We, we outsource this. We hire people to do this for us. Um, by the way, this is a graph which uh, those of you who have been here for a while are familiar with. Um, the, the blue line is the value of the endowment quarter by quarter uh, as it's jogged along over history. Uh, you know, this being September of 2003, and that being December of 2011. The red line, on the other hand, is the 12-quarter trailing average. So, so that number, for instance, is the average of the 12 of those dots that went before, and so forth. What we're looking for, of course, is the red line to go up. Um, that's the hope. The red line isn't going to go up, though, until the blue line is higher than the red line for a while. Uh, it looked pretty good last time we met in September, but unfortunately it's dipped down below slightly, so uh, it's going to take a little while longer for it to gain altitude. That's the sort of value of this graph. All right, in addition to the investments that we have in the bank, we also pay attention to the balance in our checkbook, you know, how much cash is coming in and out and how do we do based on the budget. And as we have done in every year, in the past, we monitor what we predict will be the end balance in our bank account on June 30th for this fiscal year. And we're projecting that we are again going to be under budget as usual um, by a small amount. <laughs> you don't want to be uh, over budget, okay? This is not a good thing. A lot of people pay attention when you're over budget and they decide to fix things for you by reaching in and pulling knobs and levers. So we want to be under budget, but not by gazillions. So um, that's really what we've been planning all along. The primary reason we're under budget is that we have to guess in this budget preparation season what it's going to cost, for example, uh, to pay the mortgage on the campus, for example. The college has $160 million in debt. And in fact, corresponds to about a quarter of all of our operating budget. It's like our mortgage payment. But we don't just have a fixed rate 30-year mortgage, okay? We can do better than that. We have 
variable rates that are invested in all kinds of things that are way more complicated than anything I could understand. Um, who knew that math in that area was more complicated than sending people to the moon? Uh, these days, I think it is. Um, at least understanding what it is they're telling you is more complicated than that. At any rate, um, when you get through with all of this, you find out that everything that you read says, we are in a really low interest rate period for debt. The, the federal government is holding the, the uh, interest rate at a very, very low rate. They're just saying, we want, we want people to invest. We want to, to help the folks who have mortgages that are underwater. We want banks to send that money, so we're going to give them the money at a very low rate. That's forcing the rates down everywhere, including the rate on our debt. So someday, that's going to end, <laughs> okay? Jobs are going to pick up, housing values are going to go up, and interest rates are going to go back up. When that happens, one quarter of our operating budget is going to really zing up there. Is it going to be next year? What happens if it does? So our budget committee has to predict, how much do you think we're going to have to spend for interest on our debt next year? And they put an estimate in. Well, every year for the last couple of years, we've guessed that it would cost more than it actually did. And in fact, any rational person would have guessed more than it actually did this time. As is pointed out here, we had 84 million in bonds that we paid one one hundredth of one percent on for the month of January. Uh, I wouldn't count on that. Okay, try to try to re in, in, you know refinance your house for that, and uh, get somebody to to commit to that for a long time. Um, that's why there's a surplus at the end of the year because it's not reasonable to budget for that and then have a crisis if, it, if it, it's 0.02%. Um, and as a result of that, we had some extra money left. It winds up going into the reserve fund to help us through unexpected expenses for the next fiscal year. It's not money that we spend. Okay, we're in the process of developing the budget for next fiscal year, which starts on July 1. Lots of things are underway. This is the process. We talked to the trustees about it in a couple weeks when the uh, board meeting is here. Um, and then we make some adjustments during the three months between February and May, and in May they approve the budget, and it becomes effective on July 1. So that's the process. Uh, fiscal year 13, next fiscal year, has long been projected to be the eye of the needle, as I mentioned before. Um, and so we had started in our projections last fall expecting to be about a million dollars out of balance, trying to figure out how are we going to managed to cover this. And the latest, uh, with a lot of effort on the part of folks primarily in Steve's office, but also in the cabinet, is that we are in balance at this point for the next fiscal year. And that includes two new faculty lines next year that don't exist in the budget this year, and some enhanced funds for college marketing, which I'll get to in a second. Okay, switching gears. You may remember that in November when I was here, I talked to you about strategic planning. And I said, we we're using a slightly different process. Well, that's underway, and I thought I would let you know where things stand as of February 1. Um, our new provost, Vin Mano, and I have become good friends. Um, we spend a lot of time together, turns out, um, having lunch, um, working late at night, early in the morning. Um, one of the things that we have tried to do is to develop a short document that tries to capture the heart of what Olin is about, and project where we're going and where we're going to be, say, 10 years in advance. Um, we start with a vision. What is, it, what is it that Olin is about? And what is it that Olin uh, was created for and is destined to become? The most basic things, the most fundamental, unchangeable characteristics of what the institution is, our identity. Then we talk about strategies, building on that identity and that destiny how do you think things will play out in the future as we achieve that? And then finally, there will be an implementation plan, which is more nuts and bolts, probably developed mostly by the cabinet, that says, OK, there's where we're going. This is the path we're going to take. Now, here are the actual steps we're going to take next month and then the month after it along the way. So the first draft of a vision statement, primarily, in an early guess at what strategies might look like has been developed. In fact, it's not actually a first draft. It's 
It's version 5.4, I think. Isn't that right, Vin? Yeah, and it's moving every day. Um, it, we've gotten input from our board who understands that board engagement with strategic planning is a fiduciary responsibility. This is not something that they can avoid. They need to be involved. They also know that the board can't write the plan. The board can approve the plan. And so they're interested in understanding sort of what the boundaries are, where we might go, but they're really looking for input and direction from inside the college as to what it is we're actually going to plan to do. We think we have that nailed down. We put a check in the box of board input. Um, the cabinet, of course, had a retreat in last month now in January. For a couple of days, we talked about this and got some ideas. So we put a check in that box. And we're currently in the process of collecting suggestions from the faculty. So this version 5.4 has gone out to the faculty for uh, reading. It's only about two or three pages. And it just has placeholders now for strategies. We're really, I'm convinced, frankly, don't tell the board this, but plans are not worth the paper they're written on, okay? Plans are an excuse to have a conversation about our identity and where we're going. They're, they're like a contract that you might have in a marriage. If you have to turn to page 46 and look in the fine print to see whose job it is to take the trash out, you got big problems, okay? It's really about understanding who you are and how you can work together at an intuitive level so you can make instinctive decisions on your own. And that empowers everybody in the community to make the right decision without having to refer to some plan that tells you what to do. Uh, those conversations are critical and we're just beginning them, okay? So we have placeholders for strategies, but the real strategies are going to evolve from people on the inside, people in the faculty, people in the staff, people in the student body, alumni, parents, um, we're going to identify strategies that I think will knock your socks off. I'm really excited about where we are. The discussion throughout the community will soon follow this discussion with the faculty, which is kind of midstream right now, I believe. Maybe another couple weeks, I don't know. Um, Vin and I have to keep meeting more frequently every time we do this because, you know, people at Olin like to give feedback. Maybe you've noticed that. Um, and there's only two of us that have to sift and winnow through all of this and eventually come up with the key ideas and uh, create another version and then iterate. Uh, the, we're on track, I believe, to complete the vision and select the initiatives that will be the key ones in the next plan by May. That's our goal. Uh, by the May board meeting, which is sort of in the middle of May, that part will be done. That's the part that you care about, actually, the part that you want to share with others. And then over the summer, we'll work on the implementation plan. How do we achieve these goals budgetarily and with staff assignments and so forth? And that'll be a, a cabinet homework over the summer. Hopefully that'll be done in August so our board can approve it then. So that's where this is going. Uh, by the way, I can share with you a little bit of the early thinking now. The, again, it's about our identity, who are we, things that aren't going to change. The founding precepts of Olin College, written by the founding directors of the Olin Foundation, it explains their purpose for creating the school in 1997. And you've heard me say this before, we were created to be an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. Our current vision statement builds on that. That's our identity. That's not going away. So what could be exciting about that? Well, our vision is that Olin will become the recognized leader in the transformation of undergraduate engineering education in America and throughout the world. I think we're on track for that. The large number of visits we've had from other universities, the people voting with their feet to come here, uh, the interest in what we're doing in publications continues to grow. It's a crescendo that hasn't come anywhere near its peak yet. Uh, I think the potential is very high for Olin to play that role. And for an undergraduate engineering institution, I think this puts us in the vanguard. So that's kind of the, um, the overarching vision. And then there are some core priorities, the, the sort of three principles that aren't varying, that are fundamental to everything that we do here. And the first one is about people. We are all about attracting the best in some sense, 
and producing the exceptional. And I can tell you, almost everywhere I go, Olin graduates are exceptional. I hear it from their employers. I hear it from graduate school deans. Uh, I hear it from anyone who knows them. I hear it from them about each other. If we ever stop producing the exceptional, I don't think Olin will matter on the national or the global stage. It's about people. Next, it's about driving excellence through innovation. The most common adjective used to describe Olin in any publication I've seen is innovative. It may mean different things to different people. That adjective shows up so often it cannot be ignored. It's not a surprise. It's the whole purpose that the Olin Foundation had in mind for creating the school. Everything about the invention of Olin from no tenure, no departments, and this entrepreneurship-based, design-oriented, intrinsic motivation curriculum is about being innovative. Um, that is Olin's DNA, and that's what we expect to be our DNA forever. Uh, that's a core principle. And finally, maximize the impact in the academy and beyond. That's our direction. That's where we're going. So these strategies that we're going to be w working our way through are all aimed to achieve that goal, to maximize the impact of Olin on the national and on the global stage. And the opportunities continue to open for doing that, way disproportionate to the size of the school. OK, moving on, fundraising. Um, those of you who will become alumni soon will hear a lot from Tom Crimmel. Um, your parents are already hearing from Tom Crimmel, and that's responsible for the increasing uh, size of these numbers. Uh, this is the dollars raised from our development program uh, year by year as we go forward, and we're already on track to achieve the year-end total uh, goal, and we're farther along in reaching that goal at this date than we were last year in achieving our goal for last year. So this is a program which continues to work well and is one of the really core principles for financial sustainability of the school. By the way, financial sustainability to me means one thing reducing the rate at which we have to spend from the endowment. That's it. Anything that can help us reduce the endowment spending rate is a contribution towards financial sustainability of the school. And this fundraising program, if it continues on that trajectory, is going to be an important uh, element of the financial sustainability of the school in due time. It already is significant, but it's going to be a substantial contribution in the future. Marketing. Now, you might be surprised to hear that Olin is concerned about marketing. The word marketing and higher education rarely occur in the same publication. Okay? I know that. I've been at other institutions where there have been lots of questions about this. Um, we often have a sort of allergy to marketing words. Um, it, it feels very unacademic to be marketing things. I can tell you that what we're marketing here is not widgets, it's not new devices, it's ideas. Olin needs help in describing what we do to get the attention of thought leaders and decision makers in other parts of the economy and the world who need to know about it. Anybody who has tried to explain to a neighbor why you chose to go to Olin and not Stanford knows what I mean. Okay? How do you describe this? Uh, you know, is it about the textbook that we use? Uh, do we have a, a really cool campus? I can tell you. Tom and I just got back from Stanford last week. Um, it's in January, 70 degrees and sunny. Uh, they have like several billion dollars of new buildings. Uh, you need some very powerful marketing to explain to people why you choose to come here and not go to a place like that uh, to take your undergraduate studies. Uh, and seriously, the, the sophistication of the psychological underpinnings of Olin's curriculum, this, this um, intrinsic motivation, uh, creativity and design, which to some people just sounds like arts and crafts or you know duct tape and sticky notes. Uh, what has that got to do with engineering? Um, but it's producing results. Look at our graduates. Um, explaining that is hard. We need help. So we're looking for professional help. Um, we're, we're working already with an outside consultant. He has interviewed a number of people 
already in our community, from students to trustees. He has uh, made a, an attempt to capture our own stories and put them in a form which is understandable to people who don't know us. That's impossible for us to do. We can't pretend that we don't know who we are and explain it to someone else. You need somebody who really doesn't know who you are as a test case. That's what he does for a living. And so we're also in the process of hunting for a chief marketing officer at the school who will play a role in shaping the communication that Olin creates with all of our constituencies. Now, we have devoted most of our time in the first 10 years to communicating with prospective students and parents because that was our most important constituency. Now, in the recent years, we've noticed it's more important to show, shift this a little bit to focus on employers uh, because some of you are going to graduate and get jobs. And it would be good if they knew what Olin was, all right? Uh, so we have to work on that. Uh, getting this word out is a really important thing. That's a different audience. They respond to, you know, they don't say like, well, like, I don't know, like, what I want um, in the corporate headquarters. <laughs> so the way we communicate is important. And we need different materials from our website to the, um, to the printed material that we send out and even our videos. And that's what this is about. We're going to be launching a search for a chief marketing officer very soon. This person will be a key member of our team and hopefully will shape the way we describe ourselves in the next couple of years. Now, this next little section is for those people who get a paycheck from Olin. Some of you in the audience are in that category, including uh, faculty and staff. And this is just to remind you that there's an effort underway with a committee to talk about retirement plans. This is mandated actually by the Department of Labor because they were concerned that not all employers are providing the right kind of guidance and advice to their employees, that they make the right choice with their investments for retirement. So we have a committee that's doing that and um, there will be extensive communication to employees about progress this as it goes along and here are the members of the committee in case you have questions. Um, we also have something which I think is very exciting. Again, I'm talking to the employees of the school. Uh, this is the Healthy You initiative. Um, I believe very strongly in this, that you can make a difference in your own health if you try, okay? Everything is not fate, okay? Everything is not genes. You, even if you, if you compared the longevity of a, you know, I don't know, a Yugo and a uh, Mercedes, they both last longer if you change the oil, okay? I don't care what your genes are, your body's going to last longer if you take care of it. Um, this is an initiative which says, I'll bet you there are financial benefits. If you had a community like Olin College where everybody on the faculty and staff worked out an hour every day and ate the right kinds of foods in the dining hall, I'll bet you the actual expenditures for hospital stays and for medications would go down. And if it did, the uh, costs for your medical insurance would go down as well. All voluntary, just because people were given the opportunity to take care of themselves. That's what this program is about. And at this point, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced it works if people participate. We just don't have enough data yet with only two years to know how well it works. So pay attention. There are things happening. By the way, Olin is doing other things to control the cost of health insurance. Uh, there's a consortium of 23 universities in the Massachusetts area that's working specifically on trying to increase our buying power in the health insurance market. You see, Olin is probably the smallest school of all 23. Isn't that right, Steve? It's the smallest school in the whole 23 by a lot. So we have the most to gain, okay, from having such a an opportunity to amplify our voice. And uh, this group has been working for a number of years. Steve, I think, is actually the treasurer of this group. And they've been negotiating with the CEOs of major healthcare providers and believe that we are close to uh, obtaining an opportunity to lower the at least the rate of increase of healthcare um, plans for Olin employees in the, in the future as a result of this effort. We don't think there will be any disruption to uh, the, the uh, health plans for anybody that's employed in the school, but you need to know why this is happening and who's involved. 
Okay, switching gears again. Um, upcoming events. Obviously, career fair next week, one week from today. Big deal at Olin. There are lots of companies now, probably about as many companies as we have students lined up. Um, candidates weekends, a little bit later in the month. Uh, commencement, it's going to happen. And we have Nick D'Onofrio as a speaker. Uh, this guy is really amazing. If you haven't, you know, old guys are not usually exciting as speakers. Uh, it's one of the things I've noticed. This guy's an exception, okay? You really need to go um, to his talk. Even if you're not graduating, you will enjoy it. If you are graduating, you won't care, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> a new event is going to be planned for this year for the first time. Uh, we have, we noticed that communities become what they celebrate. And if you don't celebrate the achievements and the excellence, particularly of what our students are, are getting, it, we're not going to grow in that area and we're not going to be proud of it. And so we are pl planning to pioneer this um, May uh, and special event to recognize all the members of the graduating class of 2012 who have external recognition. They've been recognized by somebody on the outside for something that they did. And we'll just bring them together in the auditorium. Their parents can be here and anybody else and uh, go through this list and help them, uh, help them celebrate together what it is we as a community have achieved. Oh, you have to push the right button. That does help. We also have things planned for the summer, by the way. We have a lot of visitors. So if any of you are around in the summer, you'll find that there are more people walking around than you've usually seen. These are from different groups. Some of them you're aware of. We've had the I2E2 program for a couple of years. It takes a couple of weeks. We also are apparently going to have a soccer camp. And Lead for America, which is a high school group, has been here a number of times. A new international group, International Quest, so English language courses, is going to bring large numbers of students for a while. Um, and of course, Green Apple, the younger kids, will be here as well. So all of this is going to be going on. The net benefit is our dining hall will be open most of the summer. So. Those of you who are around know that's the real motivation for doing this. The money is, you know. Okay, now let's switch for a moment and look outside the Oval. What's happening in the external world as it relates to Olin? Well, for one thing, just outside the Oval is Babson and Wellesley. So we have this three college consortium going on. We got a $400,000 grant to support the sustainability certificate program, which I think is terrific. There are, uh, one of the things that happens when you put the three colleges together is that the pool for whom you can talk about support uh, to the cool things that are going on on our campus gets a lot bigger because there are a lot of alumni at Wellesley and Babson who now care about what we're doing too. And through that group, we found $400,000 of support for the sustainability program. In addition to that, we have the Mellon uh, Foundation that's helping to support the Innovation Project Fund, which is a competition on all three campuses that faculty put together and students and staff proposals for things that involve all three colleges that haven't been done before. And there's a small amount of money available to help seed this effort and get it started. There are 12 new projects underway this year. We also had a faculty teaching workshop involving faculty from all three campuses earlier this month. And we had 70 attendees, which is up from last year. Last year we thought it was impossible to get that many people. Um, to get 70 faculty to assemble in New England in the winter during a holiday um, without a paycheck, uh, something wrong with this picture, okay? Must be something going on. Uh, we think this is terrific news. There is some real momentum building and affinity and an agenda and an interest in learning from each other, which is really almost unique in higher education. We also had another uh, interterm project involving a group of students from all three campuses, something that we started several years ago, where students told us to a person this was one of the most important learning experiences of their career to, in, to involve students from the other campuses with different worldviews and working on open-ended projects. Okay, the I2E2 program continues to work. Uh, it has workshops and visits from around the country. This is old data now. Last fall, we knew when it was, it was two years old, I believe, in October or November last fall. 
At that point, we had 104 universities uh, visit us in two years. Um, we also have been growing this summer institute that has um, workshops involving faculty from around the world in small teams. It's doubled in size last summer. We expect it to grow again next summer. I don't know that it's possible to double again, uh, but it's certainly growing to capacity. Um, we've also had um, an extended number of faculty members from within the school are engaged in it. So this is not just a couple of people that are engaged. It's spreading through the faculty. There's a larger number of them that are involved. And now we also have students who are engaged. There are an increasing number of Olin students who become quite seriously interested in education. And this is certainly a step in the direction of building their career in that area, an opportunity that Olin provides. So this is sort of the, the um, point of the sword of Olin's efforts to reach other institutions about uh, learning models. Um, we also, you may have heard something in the fall about international opportunities. We've been talking with a number of schools that sometimes met us through uh, an I2E2 workshop, and they have dollars in their pocket, and they have big ideas, and they want us to help. One of them is this um, group of people in Brazil that started the INSPIR school. Um, it's a private business school. It's about the same age as Olin. Um, they have big ideas of starting an entirely new engineering college, and they would like it to be patterned after the way Olin is running. And they've asked for help. And we've said, gee, that's really cool. We love you guys, but you know, we actually have a day job. And in order to do this, you know, we're going to need some resources because people are pretty busy. And that's kind of where things stand right now. We'll, we'll find out how many nickels they really have in their pocket and how big their plans really are. Um, and that will determine whether this is a big thing that we do or whether this is a little thing that we do that a few faculty members will be participating in. We've been, several of us have been down there and visited, uh, and, we, and we really think these are great people. We think their heart is in the right place and they want to make a real positive impact in Latin America. In fact, their vision for this school is that in time, the new engineering school will be the premier entrepreneurial engineering school in Latin America. And we know that they are capable of making that happen. Um, and then the old question is, do they have the will to make that happen? And are they really on track to do that? So, that, so we're learning about negotiations. So this is underway. Um, external recognition. There's uh, a lot of this, and forgive me, uh, there's no way I can cover it all. Um, th just the things that I could grab uh, very quickly. Uh, Professor Mahajan is quoted in Time Magazine, which is pretty cool, talking about his estimation in mathematics. Uh, Debbie Chatcher is interviewed in Scientific American. She also has a column now in the ASWE Prism Magazine. Um, there was the Brunel Lecture on Complex Systems uh, at MIT, which got a lot of exposure um, at the graduate program at MIT. WGBH FM has a series in it's their public radio. Uh, four years, four walls, innovating beyond the curriculum. It's Clay Christensen and a number of other key speakers, in, in, including Olin. Uh, Vin Mano was a participant in the Kauffman Foundation, tackling campus-level obstacles to innovation. Um, we also have involvement in providing strategic advice to other institutions, including Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, that I think Kevin knows all about, because that was where he was a year ago on leave. Uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in Gandhi Nagar, um, and I think we've had visitors there as well, including Ananya, is that right? Um, Harvard Graduate School of Education is sponsoring a Center for Curriculum Redesign. This is a global effort to think about what do our grandchildren need to know to survive in the year 2050. It has representatives from Finland, from Korea, from Singapore, from um, South America, all around working on the core principles of what education is about. By the way, there's some things that didn't make it onto the slides. I um, just recently got a copy of a book from uh, Tony Wagner. Tony Wagner is a um, faculty member at Harvard's School of Engineering, and his, and his book is called Creating Innovators, The Making of Young People Who Will Change the World. Okay, It's got a lot of interesting case studies in it. There are 23 pages on Olin. 
Okay, there's more information on Olin than any other school. The, he also highlights the design school at uh, Stanford, the D school, and the D lab at MIT, and he talks about high-tech high school in San Diego, but 23 pages on Olin. This is an innovative book, by the way. It has these little things in it. Maybe some of you know what this is. If you have um, a Microsoft tag reader in a, in a cell phone, as you flip through it, and there are lots of them as you go, um, you can listen to the people tell their story in their own words in a video. So I thought that was pretty cool. In addition to that, on that same trip to California last week that I mentioned earlier, Tom and I at Stanford stopped down and visited with Tina Selig, who is the executive director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program. That's their entrepreneurship program throughout Silicon Valley. It's really the premier program in that area. In fact, they're the ones who won the $10 million grant from the National Science Foundation to spread technology entrepreneurship through the world. One of the first things they did was contact Mark Somerville and invite Mark to be on the six-person board of advisors for that center. And Tina was very excited because when we arrived, Mark had just responded yes. So they were quite excited about that. Tina also is writing a book, which is going to come out in April, and the title of her book is called Ingenious, and she told me that Olin is all over that book as well. So there's a lot of interesting things, including uh, just yesterday, I got a letter from um, President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness, and there's an invitation to go next week, a week from today, to the White House for a special reception to, uh, that is being put on to honor um, and celebrate engineering deans for their excellence and commitment to educate and graduate more engineers. The corporate world got together and said, what do we need to do in order to improve and increase the number of engineers available in the U.S.? And they the deans provided them some advice, and so a group of us were invited to go to the White House. So, so the president of Intel, the secretary of education, and the secretary of energy are all going to hear about Olin firsthand. I guarantee you, I will not leave until they know all about Olin <laughs> um, next week. And of course, many others. Um, in summary, in case you hadn't noticed, this year, 2011 to 2012, is exactly the 10th year that Olin is, beginning, is teaching classes. We taught our very first class in the fall of 2002. So when we get to September of 2002, we will have completed 10 times around the track. Um, in 10 years, all of this has been built. In 10 years, the college's reputation for quality and innovation has been developed. The now stream of Olin graduates who are really making their mark, both in graduate school and in industry, has been built. We feel like we built the model now. We built uh, an institution which is worthy of investigation, it's worthy of reporting. It has a lot of people here because institutions are about people who can change the world. The next 10 years, the next 10 years is going to be devoted to focusing outside the Oval to maximize the impact in the academy and beyond. And we, there are lots of ways to do that. We're still learning what those ways are, and I'm, and I'm asking or empowering everybody here to keep your eyes out and to send us your ideas for what Olin could be doing to increase our impact. That's what this new planning process is all about. So anyway, that's it for the talk, and I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I will answer any questions if you're still awake.